I want to start um, talking actually about a uh, UC Cuba academic initiative graduate student workshop that occurred a couple of years ago where a colleague, Aisha Nive, made a comment after listening to a really interesting presentation about the distinctiveness of the barrier reef off of, off of central Cuba's southern coast. And she said, as, when she was talking about this reef, she said, you know, and Aisha is a professor at, um, uh, in Hawaii, and she tends to say pretty interesting things. Um, but she said, you know, we're always talking about um, Cuban exceptionalism. We're always saying it's exceptional. Um, exceptional maternal child mortality, exceptional agriculture and organic farming. Um, and now we're talking about how exceptional the reefs are because they've been left alone for so long. So what are we really saying when we say that Cuban is exceptional? So the exceptionalism of, Cuba, of the healthcare system in Cuba has recently been addressed in books and articles by anthropologists and others, including Stephen Brower, um, Linda Wyford, and most recently, Sean Brotherton. And these claims build upon um, the many achievements of the current government, as reported in the World Health Organization indicators, um, what Cuba watchers refer to as first world numbers coming from third world conditions. Uh, and I'll address these indices in more detail in a bit, but first I want to talk a little bit about how I came to study this question. Um, before that, I want to point out that Julie Feinsilver noted in her 1993 book, Healing the Masses, um, excuse me, um, that the Cuban state has made its superb health achievements central to its claims to modernity and moral legitimacy. As a consequence, discussions of the transformations within the healthcare system, thank you, are frequently read as an attack on the entire socialist project. So I'm really not interested in moral absolutes of what is good and what is bad about the Cuban healthcare system. Instead, in this talk, I want to give you an overview of some of the areas and issues um, that are addressed in, in discussions about Cuban exceptionalism and to provide a window into some of the unintended and often unexamined consequences of them in the daily lives of Cubans on the island. So how did I come to um, study, to get interested in this question and do this work in, on the island? Well, I conducted ethnographic fieldwork in Cuba over the course of um, three years in the mid-1990s, and, and since 2009 have been conducting work there again. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about this early work initially. So this was in 1994 through 1997, spending between three and uh, one and three months um, at various points as part of my dissertation research. And at this time, the island was undergoing a severe economic crisis known as the special period. Um, this term, the special period, um, was, uh, was sort of uh, developed in Cuba to talk about wartime rations in a time of peace or to describe wartime rations in, in a time of peace in response to the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989. So prior to 1989, um, actually Cubans in the 1990s would always talk about antes. Antes, things were this way. Antes, it was like this. And then what they were talking about with antes was before 1989. It was because prior to 1989, they were actually kind of known as the Soviet second world. And during the 1990s, um, many people argue moved into um, the, the third world in the sense of the resources that were available. And what this meant was, for example, average daily caloric consumption plummeted from over 2,800 calories a day to 1,800. So pretty major shift in diet and, and food available. Um, as, an, as an anthropologist, working on the island in the 1990s, the constraints of the special period were really obvious um, from, you know, being at home and here and experiencing the brownouts and the blackouts, um, having, hearing the soft knocks on the door of people offering, um, black marketeers offering eggs or oil that weren't available any longer in the state-run stores. Um, uh, you know, just the, the limitations of um, the ration book, which was the basis of the Cuban, uh, Cuban diet at the time. 
so many times that in that in that summer in 1994, I was offered um, when I would go to someone's home to spend time. I, it was you know everyone always wants to offer you either something to drink or some food, and I remember so many times being offered gray rice because really people were if there were any beans left at the end of the month, they were kind of setting those aside for people in the family who needed them, so they were dribbling the liquor uh, from the beans onto the rice uh, to give it some flavor, but not able to put any beans in. So it was really common at the time um, to see whole, uh, entire families on a bicycle. Um, in the 1990s, Cuba imported uh, over um, a million and a half bicycles from China. Um, due to the lack of gasoline. And this also meant that there was a virtual absence of vegetables in, in urban centers because without petroleum, it was impossible to bring produce from the countryside into urban centers. So during this time, um, I met people who were raising pigs in their bathtubs. Um, and students who were um, getting, who had dropped out of school to pursue hard currency through relationships with tourists. And young men who gain new power through their unofficial positions as intermediaries with foreign businesses who are interested in establishing inversiones or joint ventures with, um, with businesses on the island. And these opportunities in tourism and in business were, um, were part of the government's response to this economic situation. And so in the 1990s, the government um, garnered much needed income by opening the tourist sector, legalizing certain entrepreneurial activities, um, and um, allowing individual families to receive remittances from family abroad. So, for example, in 1993, um, the receipt of remittances was made legal. And at the same time, the dollar was made legal on the island. Um, which prior to that, having a U.S. dollar, having U.S. dollars was actually not sanctioned, and you could get, you could actually um, get have problems um, if you were found to have them. But after 1993, when people were allowed to have dollars, either by getting remittances from family or by working in the tourist sector. Um, <clears throat> A dual economy was established on the island, so people were actually paid in pesos, um, but then they received, they were able to use dollars if they could get them to purchase things in state in um, tourist stores, which became very necessary if you could get the dollars because the the ration book was really not covering the basic necessities at that point. So in the healthcare sector, this special period marked a distinct rupture in institutionalized forms of comprehensive care and signaled a widening gap between the material benefits of the state's provision of basic needs um, and the actual lived experience of Cubans. So many of the people I knew at the time made comments reflecting their ambivalence with the state of the healthcare system, such as um, one of the triumphs of the revolution is that our healthcare is free. I can see a doctor anytime I want, but once I get there, he has nothing to give me. And this referred to the lack of pharmaceuticals available um, after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the strengthening of the U.S. trade embargo, which is known as a bloqueo on the island, um, with the passage of several pieces of legislation in the 1990s, including the Torricelli Amendment in 1992 and the Helms-Burton Act in 1996. So my exposure to Cuban healthcare in these first few trips included hearing from women walking around with um, acupuncture needles in their upper ears that this helped them deal with the headaches that they experienced from the stress of inventando, which was basically <coughs> making meals out of very little for their families. And Hannah Garth, who is in the audience, has written a really interesting chapter on this topic um, from her work in Santiago de Cuba. Um, so, it, it, talking with women about the stress, and then also, um, I attended a number of um, rit rituals in the Santeria tradition that were held to ascertain the veracity of um, claims of HIV infection. So, basically, my exposure was really on the street and in the community with friends. It wasn't really, I wasn't hanging out in clinics at the time um, or in hospitals. So 
Um, just to give you an, an example of what it was like, though, when I did enter a hospital, um, when it, the family that I lived with um, and have continued to um, have contact with since then, so the little boy I'm going to talk about now is, is now about 18 years old, but at the time he was 18 months old. And um, one, he was, he was a really sweet little boy, but he had asthma really badly as a child. And so their morning ritual every day was to go to the neighborhood clinic and, use, and wait in line for him to use the nebulizer. So one day, um, he woke up and he had really bad hives all over his body. And they kept getting worse throughout the day. And so the, um, my friend, his mother, called the, you know, the doctor and they said, bring him to the hospital. And so we ended up spending the rest of the afternoon doing what any Cuban family had to do at the time if they needed to spend time in the hospital. We went to the dollar store to buy cotton and alcohol and we collected sheets and the other things that were necessary because even though he could get care in the hospital, the family was responsible for um, bringing the supplies that were necessary for him to be comfortable. And so this experience um, also once we got to the hospital and kind of seeing the, the, the state of the, of the room, which was not great, it was, you know, there were paint peeling from the walls and dirty floors, um, made me realize that the complexity of the care situation, the importance of, of the healthcare system being um, a basic human right, being free um, and accessible to all, but then the context of that care was very complicated in such a low, um, in, in, in such an economically challenging time. So, um, in between the trips to Cuba, I was also working in Albuquerque at the same time with new immigrants that arrived um, in the mid-1990s. And many of them had come to the US as balseros, or rafters. And so they actually left the island on inner tubes. And um, many of, actually in August 1994, over 21,000 Cubans left the island on inner tubes. And many of them were intercepted, intercepted at sea by the US Coast Guard. And um, many of the people I worked with in Albuquerque ended up spending up to 16 months in Guantanamo Bay refugee camp before being resettled in Albuquerque. Other, immigrant, other Cuban immigrants there um, came as political refugees or through a, an immigration lottery that was held by the US interest section on the island. <coughs> Regardless of how they came, though, everyone I worked with was really would comment on the difference between the U.S. and Cuba, especially the healthcare system. So, as part of my field work as an anthropologist, I accompanied many um, new arrivals to their immigration and clinic appointments, often acting as kind of an ad hoc medical interpreter. Um, and I was struck at the time by how many people were going to the doctor to manage diabetes, hypertension, and chronic ki kidney disease, um, among other chronic illnesses. And what I found was that with the, these patients were resettled in neighborhoods in Albuquerque where many other um, immigrants from other Latin American countries lived, many of whom were undocumented. And so the clinic in the neighborhood was, the doctors there were used to a certain type of Latino patient. And they had certain expectations of the kinds of communications that they were going to have with these patients. And it, that was not the kind of communication that they had with a Cuban patient who came in thinking that, you know, this doctor is going to be respectful, is going to talk to me, because I'm used to having a doctor in my neighborhood that I know and that I can have a conversation with about my health care. So for example, um, one woman that I spent a lot of time with had lupus. And she knew a lot about her own health situation. And um, she, we went into the doctor's office, and, and he prescribed her a new medication. And she proceeded to ask, well, you know, so can you tell me, um, how is this medication going to interact with the other medicines that I'm taking? And um, can you tell me, um, really, I'm not sure I understand the results from that last urine test, because a couple of months ago, the urine test said this. And just asking for very detailed information. And, the physician, you could tell just by his nonverbal communication, was not 
really happy about the extra time he was being asked to spend with this woman, and actually also by his tone. And so he ended up just recommending that she talk to the pharmacist about her medication and made another appointment. Well, for this woman, that undermined her trust in this physician because why in the world would she talk to a pharmacist when she should be talking to the doctor about her medications? And, um, and actually ended up, in her, in her case, she just sent to Cuba for the medicines she was used to taking rather than following this doctor's uh, recommendation. So um, another young man that I worked with who came as a political refugee and ended up working with the, uh, the refugee resettlement program actually I think put it pretty well when he said, the medical system is one thing I don't like about this country. We Cubans are famous for self-medicating and you know why? It's because in Cuba medical attention is free and the doctors inform you of what you have and how the medicine they're prescribing is going to affect you. They don't just send you off without explaining what's going on like they do here. So this is a real difference in experience. And again, this is in the 1990s. Um, so these attitudes and expectations uh, expressed in that quote and among many of the immigrants with whom I worked uh, resulted from the expectation of healthcare as a human right. So Linda Whiteford um, recently argued that the Cuban state has explicitly assumed responsibility for the health of the population and in doing so has struck a balance um, between the rights and responsibilities of the individual and, a state, and the state and that this balance in the Cuban context text has been struck differently than is the case in market driven health economies. And I just, I want you to remember that because I'm going to bring it up again at the end of this talk. So the cradle to grave uh, social support, which is the core of the revolutionary message and the basis of Cuban exceptionalism, is manifest in the family doctor program, um, which is currently undergoing rapid change. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that program. I apologize to those of you who are very familiar with this, um, but I feel the need <laughs> to go through it a bit. So early on, Fidel Castro argued that global inequalities should not be reproduced through disparities in access to or quality of care. And so he rejected the barefoot doctor model of many developing nations and instead uh, that rely on um, systems of paramedics and community health workers and rather developed a physician-based model like those in the U.S. and Western Europe as a means of delivering, of delivering basic health care. So according to the Ministry of Health on the island, um, the design and structure of the family doctor program allowed for greater accessibility to health care services and a closer relationship between the health team and their patients. It was originally designed to provide one family doctor and nurse per urban block, so approximately um, serving approximately 120 families or 600 to 700 individuals. And family doctors live in the community, or lived in the community, maintain continuous relationships with their patients, and often had intimate knowledge of their social and family background. These were neighbors and friends. I mean, they were people that they would you know, wait in line outside the bakery to get bread with. So they were not strangers. Um, so a central responsibility of family doctors, um, oh, wait a sec, sorry, I forgot one other thing. So when it was in initially established, Cuban leaders asserted that the family doctor program was the ultimate achievement in the field of healthcare and that it went beyond the World Health Organization's Alma Auto Declaration of 1978 on primary health care and made significant headway on a holistic approach that addressed biological factors in tandem with the individual's material and social environment. So a central responsibility of family doctors was the health of women and children. Um, so maternal child health is one of the World Health Organization indices that um, Cuba is, that is often rolled out um, because it's pretty astounding the, um, the, the levels that Ch Cuba has, has reached. So infant mortality rates on the island have been following, falling every year. So in 1989, which is the year that the Soviet, um, that the, of the fall of the Soviet Union, so this is the beginning of the transition to these economic challenges, 
um, Cuba reached a level of 11 per 1,000 live births. And that went down to 9 per 1,000 by 1995. This despite the fact that those early years of the 1990s were some of the hardest of the special period. Um, and they ended 2011 with um, um, lower than 5 per 1,000 um, live births. So this is pretty astounding. Um, they, the, uh, because of these indices, uh, Cuba ranks among the top 36 countries in the world in maternal child health. And just to give you an example, in January 2005, the Communist Party, Party newspaper, Grandma, reported the infant mortality statistics that year that were um, 5.8 per 1,000 live births. And they showed kind of a chart comparing where Cuba ranked in relation to other um, countries. And they showed that the, um, that the infant mortality rate was slightly higher than that of Canada, which was 5 per 1,000 at the time, but lower than in the United States, which was 7 per 1,000. And far below those of its neighbors, Mexico, which at that time was 23 per 1,000, the Dominican Republic, which was 29 per 1,000, and Haiti, which was 76. So the article noted, and I quote, that this undeniable achievement in the protection of the first of human rights, that of health, especially that of women and children, was achieved in a country besieged and under embargo for more than four decades by the most powerful might in the world that, on the other hand, exhibited an infant mortality of seven. So, so the, the, um, the paper was really juxtaposing the US and Cuba and making the argument that these achievements are pretty amazing, um, considering the difference between the two countries. Um, these achievements are due to a, a lot of labor, a lot of work. I mean, maternal child health is, is a priority on the island. Um, women who are pregnant go through routine physical exams. They receive a supplemental diet. Um, they undergo a minimum of two ultrasounds. Um, in the final month, they go through weekly visits, and they experience fully paid prenatal leave at uh, 36 weeks. You can come in. Yeah. That's okay. Um, so, Elise Andaya is a medical anthropologist who has uh, who's done a lot of work uh, looking at reproductive health in Cuba, and she's written extensively about the labor involved at the neighborhood le level to generate these numbers. So she quotes in um, a chapter that she uh, contributed to the, the edited volume that Raul showed you. Um, she quotes a doctor who is caring for a young woman who hadn't gained much weight during her pregnancy. And as this doctor says, um, yes, and if she gives birth to a low birth weight baby or a low weight baby, it's a huge mess for us because they send the results through the hospital, through the Ministry of Health. They analyze everything, what happened, why a birth, low birth weight baby was born. Because if the baby is born low birth weight, it will raise the rate of low weights in the country and it could raise the neonatal mortality rate as well. And so Elisa's point in, in her analysis is to show that the daily practices and labor involved um, that, that um, doctors and women are engaged in are that they're very cognizant of the relationship between what they do and these statistics. And, um, and that that consciousness is, is really important when thinking about the value of these statistics and interpreting um, what they mean for Cuban exceptionalism. So another primary arm of the Cuban medical system is the International Medical Diplomacy Program. So as many of you, I'm sure, have read in the news, um, in response to protests about the lack of accessible and adequate, adequate health care in Brazil, um, the government there developed the Mas Medicos program, um, which seeks to bring in 15,000 Cuban doctors, 4,000 from Cuba. Um, to serve, I'm, I'm sorry, 15,000 doctors, 4,000 from Cuba, um, to serve rural and hard to reach areas where current um, Brazilian doctors are not willing to go. So 400 doctors have arrived and um, they were not greeted, they were not welcomed um, by Brazilian physicians. Instead, they were greeted with shouts of um, esclavos, esclavos, or slaves, slaves. Um, and this reception um, points to the complexity of Cuban medical diplomacy. 
it's this medical diplomacy, the sending of doctors to other countries where um, there is a need, is part of the revolutionary vision of addressing health disparities and inequality across the, across the globe. And it's, this, it's, it's an integral part to, uh, an in, integral piece of um, the symbolic role that Cuba plays as a counter hegemonic um, possibility and structure. Um, in recent years, this medical diplomacy program has been criticized due to the somewhat quid pro quo nature of the exchange. So specifically, um, the Barrio Adentro, or Inside the Neighborhood Program in Venezuela, has been criticized because the Cuban government received oil in exchange for sending doctors to treat Venezuela's poor. So the, the Barrio Adentro program um, started in March 2003 uh, out of, it emerged out of an agreement between the governments of Venezuelan um, President Hugo Chavez and Fidel Castro. And under this program, over 20,000 Cubans, um, Cuban physicians and other health professionals were stationed in primarily poor neighborhoods in Venezuela. And they provided medical care in exchange for highly subsidized petroleum. And the program was popularly dubbed as the Oil for Aid program. Importantly, for thinking about healthcare on the island, this massive mobilization of physicians to Venezuela required the closure and consolidation of many family doctor clinics. Um, the result was increased patient load for the remaining doctors and greater pressure on clinic resources. So remember I said that the, um, the family doctor program is kind of the heart of the Cuban medical system. So as they're sending more and more physicians abroad, the impacts at home are that the system there is having to change. So in response to this, in March 2008, Raul, Raul Castro announced that the family doctor program would be reorganized in order to address some of the structural and staffing pro problems that were created as a result of the increasing foreign demands um, for the country's primary care physicians. And this meant a shift from an emphasis on the consultorios, or the neighborhood clinics, which had been the capstone of Cuba's primary health, health sector, to a network of more dispersed polyclinics, staffed by a limited team of doctors and nurses who attend to a greater number of patients. So these changes have meant that Cubans are no longer assured of easy and quick access to doctors as they were in the past. Yes? Oh, I'm sorry. OK, is this better? Yes. OK, sorry about that. Thank you for letting me know. Um, so uh, uh, Sean Brotherton is another uh, medical anthropologist who's written quite a bit about um, medical diplomacy and the effects of sending these, um, the effects of, of these deployments, the effects that these deployments have had on um, the experience of medical care on the island. <clears throat> and so as he's written, many on the island have been frustrated and saddened by the disappearance of the family doctors in their own communities. Some argue, um, have stated that, you know, health workers at the polyclinic are in effect strangers. They're, they quickly review your file, write prescriptions, and usher you out the door. This sounds really familiar to me <laughs> in terms of my experience here, but it's also really familiar to me in terms of what I heard from Cubans in the 1990s criticizing the care they were receiving in the United States. And now this is Cubans on the island being critical of the healthcare system there. Um, and then they've also, uh, Sean has also quoted another, um, another informant who said that the Cuban model of primary care being exported is in many ways not the one being practiced at home. So, so in addition to investments in um, the family doctor program and medical diplomacy, Investment in biotechnology has been an elemental strategy underlying Cuban's response to the health, economic, and diplomatic challenges of the post-Cold War era. Today, Cuba is the largest medicine exporter in Latin America and has more than 50 nations on its client list. Cuban medicines cost far less than those coming from the US and Western Europe. And the government has helped China, Malaysia, India, and Iran, among others, set up their own factories in a south-to-south -south technology transfer. By 2008, Cuban biotech researchers had been granted over 1,200 patents. 
26 of them in the United States. An example of the success of Cuban biotechnology is the development of um, a Cuban vaccine for advanced non-small cell lung cancer therapy. Um, in July 2004, CancerVax, which is a, um, a California biotech company, received federal approval to test this Cuban vaccine in the United States. Um, CancerVax is, is the first U.S. company to receive such approval. So that's pretty astounding change. Um, another, in another astounding change, um, Miami Congressman Joe Garcia is now pushing for to support the testing of um, the Cuban diabetes drug um, Herberprot B, which is an epidermal growth factor treatment for, um, for diabetic wounds that won't heal. He's actually, because it's such a powerful drug, he's pushing to, be, to um, support the testing of this drug in the United States in recognition of the burden of diabetes in the United States and the need for effective interventions to avoid um, amputation for those at high risk. Um, so this drug, Herber, Herberprot B, um, has been used in 16 countries and to treat over 100,000 people. So in an interesting turn, this is a, a recent study that was published in the British Medical Journal. And this uh, picture is actually from The, the Guardian um, uh, reporting on the study from the BMJ. Um, but this British Medical Journal study reported on the health effects of the deprivations of the early years of the special period. So remember how I said that in the very early years, um, you know, caloric intake went down, um, but also uh, maternal infant um, or infant mortality went down. So there's, it's, there were lots of things happening. But despite the, the reemergence of previously eradicated infectious diseases um, and other things that occurred at, at, during these years, this study reports positive effects related to the population level decrease in weight. So in those first years of the special period, the population as a whole experienced a decrease in weight of 5.5 kilograms. At the same time, there was a marked decrease in diabetes and heart disease. Um, so this is pretty exceptional to be able to see on a population level this kind of weight decrease and the effect on these chronic diseases. So as popu the study also reports that as population weight started to rebound in 1995, where in 1995 there was uh, just over 33% prevalence of overweight and obesity, and continued to exceed the pre-crisis, pre-1989 levels, by 2010, where there was almost 53% um, overweight and obesity. Diabetes prevalence increased by 116%, and um, diabetes incidence by 140%. So six years into the weight rebound phase, diabetes mortality increased by 49%, uh, from 9.3 deaths per 10,000 people in 2002 to 13.9 deaths per 10,000 people in 2010. So it's an interesting study. Um, it raises lots of questions. But an, I think another interesting piece of it is that this was published in British Medical Journal um, the, by authors from um, uh, Johns Hopkins um, and a, a university in Spain, as well as um, a Cuban um, epidemiologist from PAHO, Pedro Ordunez, um, and published in a scientific journal. And these authors took the opportunity to state in that journal that they, while they thought these findings were important, they protested the conditions which produced this possibility. So that's really interesting to put in a scientific journal. So they stated. Um, and I'll read it to you. We would like to acknowledge our great respect and admiration for the Cuban people who faced extremely difficult social and economic challenges during the special period, and by making common cause against this tragedy held up with courage and dignity. This tragedy was man-made by international politics and should never happen again to any population. So it's just really interesting that that was put in, in this study. 
So in, in 2006, the report um, Health Projections in Cuba for 2015 was published. And this report identified chronic diseases as a primary cause of death on the island, accounting for 90% of deaths. And these are diseases like those found to, be, to, decre to have decreased during the early years of the special period. Due to the primary care and prevention orientation of the healthcare system on the island, again embodied in the family doctor program, there are many programs in place to support healthy lifestyles um, as they're referred to in public health. These include Tai Chi in the mornings, accessible to all, as well as yoga and walking groups and dancing. Although I have to say, everybody I talked to about the Tai Chi said that there's only, only people of a certain age actually do that. So they're accessible to all, but you know, not, not everybody does it. So um, to, since 2010, I've been working with a group at the University of Havana Health Sciences on various approaches to chronic disease management or self-management, including a pilot study comparing the effects of um, a neighborhood-based promotora program, which is a community health outreach worker program, um, designed to augment the changing family doctor structure, focused on patients with diabetes and hypertension. So see, recognizing the change in the structure, um, this group decided, well, what if we put a community health worker in this neighborhood you know, similar to the family doctor model, somebody who already lives in the neighborhood, but who's going to pay attention to um, patients who are suffering from diabetes and hypertension and provide support and actually link these patients with pre-existing programs, like get them to go to the Tai Chi, get them to do the walking groups, whatever. Um, so one of the challenges that this group has faced and that exists to chronic disease or lifestyle interventions is the context in which they occur. Um, while many of the people that were approached to participate in this research um, were interested, because they were interested in thinking about exercise and stress management and how that might help their health issues, um, they were reluctant to do it because of the effect it might have on their families. Now, you might ask, what do, you, what do I mean? Well, all families receive um, a libretta or a ration book. I've mentioned that. It's part of the contract that the state has with each individual that we're going to provide the basic, your basic needs, um, a basic diet. And, you, and this is used to purchase food from state-run stores. Most people rely on the black market or other, um, other stores to supplement, but for those who can't um, augment their diet that way, the, 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 um, the extra diet, the extra foods that they receive because they have a diagnosis of diabetes is extremely important. So I mentioned with the, um, when I was talking about maternal child health, women receive an augmented diet when they reach a certain point in their pregnancy. When you have a, a diagnosis of diabetes, you get a special diet because of that. Well, if they engage in a stress management program or lifestyle intervention that takes care of their diabetes, then the whole family reverts back to the basic ration book instead of the augmented diet. So it's an interesting barrier that we hadn't really anticipated when we started thinking about this study. Um, members of this research group are also involved in the laughter group at the University of Havana Health Sciences. And this is an interdisciplinary group that utilizes innovative measures, including um, MRI imaging, to track the effects of laughter on the body. And they've done some interesting work looking at gender differences in responses to jokes and things like that. Um, their research takes place, has taken place in pediatric cancer hospitals and is affiliated with the National Cancer Institute and the Center for the Promotion of Humor. They, this group argues um, that laughter has therapeutic effects and that their research has shown um, that these effects include helping individuals overcome negative consequences of stress, eliminating anxiety and tension, increasing self-esteem, elevating the spirit, stimulating the imagination, clarifying perception, and decreasing worries and fears. Um, they, this, this program is connected with international movements uh, for laugh, the, like, like the laughing yoga movement and other movements that are interested in laughter as a therapy. 
And it's particularly interesting to me um, because it focuses on a Cuban cultural practice that in literature and history has been shown uh, to be subversive, humor. That it, humor creates a space for subversive discussion, for questioning the status quo. And what we're seeing with this research group is that they're actually focusing on the physical experience of laughter rather than the humor that generates that laughter. And by doing so, they're actually creating a treatment modality that they argue is capable of mitigating the consequences and progression of chronic diseases such as diabetes, hypertension, and obesity. So um, in August 2012, the Cuban Communist, the, the um, party paper, Grandma, published a series of articles over the course of two weeks asking the question, your health care is free, but how much does it cost? In which they detailed costs associated with services from a primary care visit to various surgeries, um, to acupuncture, I mean, they talked about everything um, in these two weeks, to raise awareness among the population that these services are free, but they have a cost. And this rhetorical shift marks a change from the human rights rhetoric in place since 1959 to a market-based approach to healthcare services. In a time of shrinking resources, centralization of healthcare, and cost cutting, such a shift suggests further changes in the future. And it also suggests a different way of thinking about this balance that Linda Whiteford talks about between um, the state and, and individuals in terms of healthcare. Um, that she argued is very different in Cuba because it's a socialist contract. And as we move into this more market-based logic, how is that contract shifting is one of the questions. Um, in the same month, the Associated Press uh, re writing about this process re reported that, um, that this process was part of a wider media campaign that seems geared, and I quote, to discourage frivolous use of medical services to explain or blunt fears of a drop off in care, and to remind Cubans to be grateful that healthcare is still free despite persistent economic woes." End quote. So I'm going to close with this beautiful scene. <laughs> um, but in closing, the question, this, this, this turn to a market-based um, discussion raises then, is if Cuban exceptionalism is based in the commitment to healthcare as a human right, how might this move toward a market-based logic undermine or change the meanings of exceptionalist claims? While the restructuring of the family doctor program has not had an impact on health indices, <coughs> many Cubans who had become used to immediately accessible medical service and see it as a key role and responsibility of the revolutionary government are dissatisfied with this change. While such issues may seem trivial given the major healthcare problems in other, faced by other countries, including parts of the United States, they're nonetheless central to Cubans' own experience of their health, healthcare, and their shifting relationship to the Cuban government. So especially at a moment in history where the healthcare system faces the challenges of addressing chronic diseases in the context of structural constraints, which make lifestyle and self-management interventions difficult, such as a lack of portability uh, for both food and glucose monitoring for diabetes patients, the creativity and flexibility in forming Cuban healthcare will be paramount. This creativity is, as anthropologists have shown, is found in the labor and practices of individual Cubans, the work that leads to the exceptional indices. So where we focus our analysis of Cuban exceptionalism at the level of statistics or daily practices does make a difference. Thanks.